Inspiration and ideas. This is hugely important. And if there's one thing I think I'd love to see more people do in the photography community, is I'd like to see them reach a little bit more deeply into great photographers of the past and also really, really excellent contemporary photographers who may not be active on social media. Quite often, if you just consume uh, photographs on social media or in camera club competitions or those speakers who are on the camera club circuit, you are seeing the tiniest, tiniest morsel of what is out there. And some of the greatest photographers I know working now have no presence on social media. They are so beyond that. And yet their work is absolutely inspirational. So I would strongly encourage you to dig more deeply looking at the work of other photographers. I have had one or two clients for very ethical reasons say to me, I don't want to look at other photographers' work because I'm afraid that I will become derivative, that I will copy them. My answer to that is, don't ignore other people's work. That's a bit like a novelist saying they don't read novels. That's not going to work. But instead, look at lots and lots and lots of different work. You're far less likely to be derivative to copy one photographer if you're looking at a lot. So do lots more of that. And there's lots of lovely places online where you can store your inspiration. The top left there, that's Pinterest. Um, a guilty secret of mine. I like Pinterest. And I've got, I don't know if you can see from the size there, but I've got um, pin boards for lots of wonderful photographers of the past and also some current ones whose work I find inspirational. So it's a really great way to keep that inspiration for yourself. Behance, Adobe's own photo sharing site, is also excellent for this. You have to get through a lot of stuff there but there are ways to narrow your search to photography. But I would encourage you not to limit your inspiration to photography alone. Painters, they have to compose and use light just like us. And if you can get to exhibitions, you should be doing that, painters and photographers. Um, it's been hard for the last 18 months or so for obvious reasons, but ex exhibitions are starting up again. I've been to a few excellent ones in London already this summer. And there have been a lot of online ones too. And that gives you a chance to really dive in deep and get inspiration in depth from one person's work. Magazines. Well, all right, there's repetition. It's October soon. So how to use autumn color? Anybody? It's going to be in every single magazine in the next two months, right? But you can still find really new and interesting work. I mean, outdoor photography, one of my favorites, has um, introduced me to so many photographers I didn't know in that first big interview section. Um, and also, to be honest, in the readers uh, section, lots of people who are maybe not very well known, but are brilliant. Don't limit yourself to stills, movies and TV. That's Game of Thrones up there. Apart from the last episode, I loved it. Um, I reckon you could freeze any episode of Game of Thrones at any point and have a perfectly composed still photograph. Books. I only have to read the storm scene in David Copperfield to yearn to get down to the coast and photograph waves. And music. Darwin said that the music, music is the most powerful of all the arts because it bypasses our brain and goes straight to the feels. So uh, in fact, if I'm ever editing a picture and it's just not working, not feeling it, sometimes putting on some really great music just gets you there. So music as well. This is all really important stuff. Don't limit yourself to your own genre. These are two photographs. One on the left is of telegraph wires by Harry Callahan, one of the greats of the 20th century. If you're not familiar with his work, you should be. Go and look him up and create a Pinterest board. And on the right, that's Sales by Jonathan Critchley, who needs no introduction. Um, completely different subject, different centuries, but look at the similarity. You can get inspiration from all genres. If you want to really understand spotlighting, follow some street photographers. And then the boring prosaic bit, but so important, research and planning. Well, I could do a whole half hour on that, but everyone will fall asleep, so I'm going to be swift. First of all, it's the photography show. There are probably stands here I've yet to explore, selling location photo books, guides. 
we sometimes sneer at those. Oh, yeah, how, how silly is that? But actually, there's no shame in using them. They're a great springboard if you're going somewhere new. And I have some in my library. Um, when you get there, you start with the obvious photo and then you start looking for other things. So no shame in using those. Google Images does a good job too. Um, so th there's a screen grab from a search just for Kirkufell, which I'm pronouncing really badly. I can't do the Icelandic, it ends in a sort of <laughs> noise. Um, and from Cannon Beach. And we can see that if you go to Kirkufell, you have to photograph a waterfall trying to upstage a mountain. And if you go to Cannon Beach, you have to photograph a blingy sunset. Well, do it, get it done, and then move on. So when I'm going somewhere new, I do these searches, not to copy the work, but to try and avoid that. But it's still good research. And then, obviously, there are lots of apps out there that um, there's an obvious one in the middle there that you'll recognize. I'm not advertising for them. Um, where you can see what angle the sun is going to be and the moon is going to be at any location. But still think a bit harder. That's Berlin Gap in the middle there. Berlin Gap is backed by very big cliffs. If you're looking to photograph waves, it's a great location. But don't go there when the wind is from the north because the cliffs will stop it and the sea will be calm. All boring but necessary. Weather apps, I use the Norwegian one, yr.no, which apparently is pronounced something like ur. And I used it a lot in Iceland, where I've just come back for three weeks in Iceland. And at the end of it all, we agreed in the bus that to ur is human, because they were wrong quite a lot. Um, but they're still one of the best. The point is, though, weather forecasts fail all the time. If you've carved out a day for photography, and on the morning of, the forecast is bad, go anyway. They're probably wrong, especially if it's the coast. And anyway, maybe bad light will make you more creative. And finally, for me, of course, being a seascape photographer, tides. Not just knowing the time of high and low tide, but also how big of a tide it will be. So today, they've got a big tide down at where I tend to go to do photographs. That means that it's going to be really good if they had high seas. They don't. It would be good at the top of the tide. But it also means along the coast at Berlin Gap, there'll be lots of sand at low tide, which is really, really nice. So all important and boring, but necessary. But with all of this planning, at the end of it all, I strongly, strongly encourage you, when you are out, to still be prepared to adapt. I am, as I say, just come back from Iceland. One of the many things I love about the Icelandic people is they're so adaptable. They have to be. Their climate is weird, and it does all sorts of strange things in 15 minutes. So they can make plans, but they'll have to change them. So they don't really do as much planning, maybe, as some other people. But they do make plans, and they go out ready to adapt at the last minute. And I would always encourage that, too. You know, if you're planning to do big waves, and you get there, and it's no good, then do something else. Don't go home in a huff, or go and get a cup of coffee. Or if you do get a cup of coffee, come back out again afterwards. So then we've got to our location, always nice. And before you start to make photographs, do the first five things on this list. Absolutely, be there, walk it, watch it, listen to it, experience it. This is so important. On a very boring level, that first composition you've seen might not be the best one. You might spend your whole time there working that, and just as you're walking back to the car, you see something so much better and time's up. But from another perspective, it's all about soul. I think you make better photographs somewhere if you've really felt the mood of the place and it has inspired you. In Iceland, my first group, I took them one morning to a waterfall, not one of the big ones, but beautiful nonetheless. And as we were there, another chap arrived. He got out of his car and he marched down to the waterfall. And his face was determined, really determined. And his body language was, no, I'm going to get this done. And he got there and he made his photograph. And then he marched back to the car, leapt in it and drove off. There wasn't a screech of tires, but I did think of including that for a effect. But anyway, he drove off. Now, no doubt he's super efficient. And no doubt he got a lovely photograph. Well, maybe he didn't. But honestly, he didn't experience that place. For me, that's just, you've thrown the baby out with the bathwater there. 
Why are we outdoor photographers? Because we love the outdoors. So absolutely, those first five things are so important. Then comes camera craft. Well, obviously, there's no point in me talking about that. You all know all about exposure and aperture and composition and anyway, we'd need four days. Um, and then review. This is the first time I review my photographs. Does everyone know what chimping means? Maybe some people don't. Thank you for being honest because I enjoy explaining this one. So chimping is when you look at the pictures on the back of your camera and make noises like a chimpanzee. Ooh, ah, ooh, like this because you're so excited with your photographs. And of course, it's funny, but it also has ever so slightly a derogatory tone to it. Now, why would you chimp? You're not a proper photographer. I, what a load of rubbish. That's, that's people who are still embedded in film photography, I think. I mean, one of the great things about digital is that we can look at the photo on the back of the camera while we're still there. And if we didn't do it quite as well as we wished, we can do it again. So that's my first time when I review my photographs. And then if it's not as good as I want it to be, I'll try again. But this, I'll come back to this. This is so important. Be experience driven, not results driven. For me, that is the only way I'm still going, frankly, because I'm quite fussy and getting a keeper is not an everyday occurrence. But getting down with the camera somewhere beautiful is an occurrence that I I value on its own. I don't need a keeper. Um, at the beginning of my second group, we had a little sort of introductory chat, and then we did, we were drinking. I wasn't driving. And we, we did cheers like this and toasted, and one of the people there said, here's to keepers. Well, that's fine, I mean, it didn't tell him off, but I would have wished he'd said something else. Right, then you come home, and the digital dark room. Has anybody seen Sean Tucker's uh, documentary about my work? You will have seen that he cheekily filmed the queue of 15 memory cards next to my computer. For me, it's really important to wait. I try to have the biggest gap I can between capture and uploading the pictures to the computer. I use Wordsworth as an example here. We've, gone, we've done Darwin, so it's only fair to have a poet. Um, Wordsworth said that great art is created, comes from strong emotion recollected in tranquility. So he would wander among his daffodils and be inspired, but he wouldn't write the poem until much later when he was sitting in his studio, calm, collected and objective. I absolutely, as you can probably tell, love making photographs out on the beach. It's a very emotional very uh, exciting experience for me. And I'm on a high. I'm on an emotional high. It's the great le best legal high I know. And that can last a really long time. I need that to dissipate. If I look at my pictures, if I upload them while I'm still on that high, I will be disappointed with them. They will never measure up to how I felt when I was there making them. So I would really encourage you to wait as long as you can. And then wait some more. And then when you're ready, upload them. Don't delete, unless it's a black rectangle because you started a long exposure and changed your mind or something catastrophic happened. Even if you, you know, the wave was coming and you ran away from it during a long exposure, well, that's, a, that's an unintentional camera movement, which is, you know, ICM is so last year. UCM is the best. So don't delete those. You never know. But seriously, I have got so many photographs that I have, um, have become favorites of mine now that had I been a tidy Lightroom user, they would have gone in the bin. Because when you go out to make your photos, you might have something particular in mind. A year later, you might have a whole different agenda. And then one of the pictures that you rejected last year might be the best in the bunch. So once you have uploaded them and you haven't deleted them, pick some you like and edit. And I edit quite slowly. Only I have a 10 minute rule. If, I, if a picture takes 10 minutes, more than 10 minutes of editing, then I fluffed it up in camera and I'm not going to bother. But 10 minutes isn't done in one go. It's done slowly and incrementally. And if I leave a picture overnight and then go back to it the next morning, I usually find myself backtracking two or three steps in the history because I went too far because I had looked at it too long. So definitely go slowly and then wait some more. 
And here is an example of what I was just saying. This photograph was made on the 8th of February, 2016, Storm Imogen. That was the big storm where I captured the bulk of my sirens portfolio. And if you want, if, if anyone here hasn't heard me talk about that before, I'm talking it on the cannon stand spotlight stage at one o'clock about sirens. Um, but anyway, I was after isolated waves of character. So I ignored all the photographs that I made with the lighthouse in them. But then we had lockdown. And of like everybody else, nothing to do but go and raid the hard drive. And I found this. And I really like it now because I'm not doing sirens anymore. And now this picture is valuable to me. And a big print of that just sold to a collector in America. So it's literally valuable to me. Thank goodness I didn't delete the 3,000 photographs I made on that day. This is the next step, and this is so important. And since I'm on the photo speed stand, I probably ought to mention it, really. Um, printing is an integral part of my workflow. And I do make my living from selling limited edition prints. But even if I didn't, it's still going to be a really important part. And the way it works is once I think I've finished an edit of a photograph, I print it at A3 size, so not a tiny print. And I stick it on my wall or pin it to my notice board. That's the least messy corner of my studio. And you can see I've got two versions of the same picture, two different prints pinned up there. And I'll leave them up. And I'll come and go every day in my studio. And I'm seeing those prints. And it's amazing what you notice that you didn't notice at first. Because um, also seeing your print come off the print is quite emotional and you might not always be objective at that stage. And if you see something that you missed, an annoying highlight at the edge of the frame, you only get six out of 10 for that camera club, wouldn't you? Or uh, a dust spot that you'd forgot to know, you know, deal with. Amazing how they hide and only appear on the print. Um, then I go and edit it again and print it again. And after the print has withstood that scrutiny, <coughs> that's when I deem it ready to go out into the world. I use a Canon Pro 1000. That's kind of old tech now. There are newer printers out there, but I've had it for a while. It's still going strong. Little tip for you. Anyone here use a Pro 1000? Okay. If, you, if your um, ink cartridges, the spring breaks, which is a thing, don't get a new one. It's not economical, repair, economical to repair, but a pair of pliers does the job just fine. I've been got a pair of pliers attached to my printer and I've been using them for a year and it's just fine. Save yourself a lot of money. Sorry, people selling Canon printers. Um, and these are the papers, my favorite papers. Two photo speed papers there, NST Bright White and Platinum Etching. And I'm going to, there's not many of you here, so maybe Steve, could I get you to help? If anyone doesn't want to touch them, um, that's fine, of course, for COVID reasons. But Steve, would you mind passing these round. I've written on them, and that one goes at the bottom. I've written on them the paper I've used, so you can actually feel the paper. Um, so NST Bright White is the paper I use for all of my black and white photographs. It's a lovely paper. It has a pure white base, hence the bright white. It has a lovely, subtle texture that eats up noise without taking over, and I love the way it captures blacks. I know that there are a lot of really good professional black and white photographers who insist that you only get an inky black on a glossy paper. You'll hear that said a lot. That might be true, but the shine on the paper neutralizes that. So for me, the matte paper, even though the, the black might not be quite as black as it is on the glossy, it looks blacker. So I love a matte paper for black and white. And then platinum etching is a different paper. It's got more of a cream base. Not good for black and white, in my opinion, because why would I want my white to be cream? That's black and cream, not black and white. But it has a lovely, slightly more grainy texture. So if you can see, for example, the bottom left, the rust detail, that's on platinum etching. And it really gives it more of a three-dimensional feeling. And then um, I also love a paper, not by Photospeed, but they do supply it. Hanamula Fine Art Pearl. And almost all of my color sirens are on that paper. It's 
the least glossy of the glossy camp, and it's about as glossy as I'm willing to get. Um, but it has a really great ability, wide gamut, and it does gradients beautifully, and also really nice colors and detail. So those are my three favorite papers. Feel free to um, sample them, but I do need those back. And then finally, publication. Well, I'm not going to go through all of these things because you know what they are. But really, that's just there to make the following point, that I can include social media. And I would also, for the Camera Club members here, include a Camera Club competition as publication. So all of this workflow would happen before I shared the photograph with anybody publicly in any arena. If you are the sort of photographer who's more of a lifestyle kind of influencer type, you have to do it differently because you have to feed the social media machine. It's your living. But that's not me. I don't have to feed the social media machine. And indeed, I'm more and more conscious that the, the, the desire to have a new photograph can be really destructive to your creativity. So I would much rather share a picture I shared a year ago, again, than share a picture that isn't ready yet. And once it's out there, it's out there. Even if you archive it on Instagram, it's still out there. So I really, really find this is the best route for me. And that's um, where you can find me if anyone doesn't uh, yet engage with me on social media. But what I really wanted to do was allow time for questions and to make it more fun, the first four people to ask a sensible question will get a little present. So hands up. It's a very nice present. No one's going to ask a question. Come on, it doesn't have to be about what I talked about. Yes, Amy. Come closer, I can't hear you. Okay, thank you. So uh, just in case you couldn't hear that, um, because it's very noisy here, isn't it? Amy, who is also a professional photographer um, who I follow, very good. Um, she asked me how, as a female photographer, I manage the work-life balance. And I'm just going to say, controversially, I, I, I manage it in the same way that male photographers do. I don't actually think gender is relevant. Um, I'm a photographer. I'm not a female photographer. Sorry, Amy, but I get quite about that. Um, but, you know, men work, unless you're retired, men, you know, work full time too. They have children, they have spouses uh, or partners, and so do I. Um, and it's hard, isn't it? Life is busy. I'm mean, honestly, some of my retired clients, I don't know why they're retired. They're busier now than they ever were when they worked. They're on every committee going and they're governors of schools and it's really, really hard. Um, and I think the biggest gift we can give ourselves, whether we're professional or not, is to stop thinking of our photography time as an indulgence. It's not. Being a fulfilled creative person is as much self-care as going and getting those important health checkups that when you get to my age, that, that letter comes through the letterbox far too often. I think it can't really be five years since that. Um, it's just as important. And everyone who depends on us, our clients, our family, our children, our friends, need us to stay healthy mentally as well as physically. And anyway, those two are, of course, connected too. So um, it is hard. Uh, the hardest thing of all is because right now I'm in the middle of the craziest schedule of workshops ever because they've all been postponed. But I already, I mean, my workshops book up two years ahead. So I, they've been postponed into a period that was already full of workshops. So I'm literally, this is about the only day when I'm not doing workshops for about a month. And it is exhausting. And I think I have to be very careful. Um, look, it's a little easier for me than it is for you, Amy, because my kids have, have left. And I miss them. What? Oh, thank you. Yes, you... You don't want them. No, you, you love your children, right? You really don't want me to have them for a day. <laughs> they come back very strange. Um, anyway, thank you for the question, Amy. Come and have a... Did I give you one? Oh, 
There you go. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Yes. I, I go off. Go back to a location. Yeah, um, all the time. I've captured an image I'm happy of. It's a really good question because actually my photography isn't about place. If you look at my work online, there are very few pictures where the place is referenced. Proper landscape photographers usually name their photographs after the place because they are working artistically, but they're still documenting a location. I'm not interested in that. So, in fact, more than 50% of the photos on my website were made in East Sussex at three or four locations. And I just go back over and over again. And there's always something new to do. Um, and in fact, um, I did check the other day for my other talk. I don't think there is a single photograph in my portfolio that was made on my first visit to a location. Um, I think then you just do the obvious and you have to go back then and, and to find the, the more interesting pictures. So come and have a card. There you go. Thank you. Hang on a sec. Dave, you're going to have to hold the mic up. I can't, I can't hear over this music behind me. Uh, I'll, I'll back off the there we go. Back off the mic a bit. There we go. Um, it's a technical question. When you're, uh, say, you, you were doing your sirens images, uh, are you shooting there in, then in burst mode? You've obviously got a composition where you're seeing the wave falling in the manner you want it to. Are you then shooting in burst mode and trying to capture the, um, and then choosing your favourite image from there? those uh, yeah and what sort of focal lengths and what sort of distances are you away from from the waves at that point okay here's the sirens recipe write it down everyone oh, yeah. Well, yeah. although everyone else is doing it too um 70 to 200 millimeter full frame um and uh in fact fun people often think that it's a longer focal length longer focal length can be used it's hard though because when you're shooting a, i've got a 100 to 400 if you're at the long end of that you can't see enough of the sea to find the waves. And I've also missed a number of photos because the waves were so big that 70 millimeters wasn't wide enough. Um, so that's the compromise focal length to get the best results at that location. If it's a different beach, if it's a shallow beach, the waves will break further out, then you're gonna have to go longer. Yes, shooting in burst mode, three or four shots per wave and picking the best one. And, and actually, this, the skills for sirens are far more like the skills of a sports photographer or a wildlife photographer than they are landscape. Certainly not, not using a tripod. I mean, it's too windy for a tripod anyway in those conditions. But also, you know, you're shooting at a thousandth of a second. You don't need a tripod. So why would you, why would you constrain yourself? Come and get a card. I've got one more card. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I do use filters. I'm a Lee filters master. And, um, but out of the photos on display here, there's only um, two. Yes, Dave is pointing out that blue one. It's even got that famous particular point on the color wheel known as Lee filters blue, because I like it. I'm a seascape photographer, blue's my friend. And the one above it, I used a grad. Um, the others weren't taken with filters, but I do use them um, for um, a lot. I'm a big fan of grads, even though a lot of people think they're really old fashioned. Just do it in Lightroom, right? Mm. Um, no, I, I want to see it on the back of my camera while I'm still there. I don't want to think when I get home in Lightroom, I'll do this, that and the other. So um, yes, I'm a big fan of filters. And if you do long exposures, of course, you've got to, got to use them. Right. So I hope that, I'm sorry if other people missed out on the cards. It gets expensive if I have too many and I need to save the rest for Canon. Um, but if there were any more questions, I'm, I'm just, you don't get a card, that's all. Sorry. I have a question. Yes. Oh, no, uh, no, go on, you can go oh. first. Um, I, I uh, do most of my stuff underwater, oh. which, is, which is difficult in the pandemic. And I don't do it, 
I don't sell stuff. I don't have to earn my living. I'm unfortunate to be able to go anywhere in the world to die. Do you ever uh, wear a wetsuit and get close, up close? To, I just wonder, you know, or you just have an underwater housing. But I just wonder whether, because I know you can get some under over shots. I'm yeah. thinking of saltwater crocodiles, but but, but um, just some of the some of the effect of the waves uh, yeah, and I the mean, thermoclimbs you get. I just wondered. No, good question. Um, I don't. In fact, anyone who gets into the water on Sirens Days is uh, winning the Darwin yeah, Award. Yeah, yeah, winning yeah. the Darwin Award, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I don't. I'm, I'm, um, I'm not a good enough swimmer, frankly. So I leave that sort of thing to the people who are, I think it would be foolhardy of me to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and if we don't have any crocodiles in the UK, but if we had saltwater crops in the UK, yeah. I can tell you I would even less likely get into the water i'm you know they're lovely from a distance yeah. um but you know total respect to you doing underwater diving yeah, yeah. Uh, photography yeah. that's um, amazing cl clearly you wouldn't go out in a, in a oh, sorry force eight um, force you, ten force ten you won't dive in anything more than force four yeah because you've got to get back in the yeah the of course you know. um but I'm just wondering when it's slightly calmer, whether you can get, um, get down close to... Well, I, I do get into the sea. Yeah, that's what um, I Most of, I mean, for example, the, the blue photograph mm. was made standing, the sea was probably there. Yeah. Um, and I do like to get the camera on the tripod, because obviously long exposure, as low as possible. Yeah. The, um, I mean, a, a general tip, uh, if your camera's weather sealed, it's really good to get it just above the surface of yeah. the sea with the waves coming in because that forced perspective is way more dramatic than from on high. Um, and I have a pair of very embarrassing waders. Steve, have you seen the waders? Steve's seen the waders. He's sworn to secrecy though. He's not allowed to tell you how embarrassing they are because there's one wreck that I like to photograph that you have to wade out to. Um, yeah, they're mauve. They looked blue. They looked navy blue on the website, but when they arrived, they were mauve. It's not a good look. Dave. Marvellous. So my, my my question is is kind of going back to some of the stuff you mentioned about social media. And I was just wondering if you had, I mean, I'm that guilty person that feels like you have to constantly keep up with, with the Joneses or whatever the expression is. How do you keep and maintain that restraint of not feeling like you have to keep up? And, and I'm sure there's many people that like some tips on how you kind of have that restraint about not needing to post pictures all the time. Um, I wish I could say it was easy. Sometimes I have to stop myself because we all feel that pressure. Um, it's really hard, actually. And, um, you know, we all like, everyone likes that rush of dopamine when someone likes your picture or shares it or follows you. Can't help it. Our bodies are designed to feed us that drug. Um, I think my fear of posting really embarrassing pictures is even stronger than the pleasure I get from people liking my pictures. Um, the thing I'm trying to change, being very honest now, which I'm not very good at, is to share work that I like that I know others won't like. That's the harder thing. So I, you know, I'm, I'm putting stuff up on social media traditionally that I know people will like. But that is a creative straitjacket, and it's not good. So my decision now is to start sharing work that I like. So, for example, this is for the Canon lot, so I can't give it away, but um, this photograph, I really like that. I put that on Instagram the other day, and it got half the number of likes that one of, those, one of my waves would get. Does that matter? I've decided it doesn't. And um, that's quite liberating. Yeah, no, I, I, th I, th I think it's a very, very good message and a well, well deserved round of applause. I think it's, it's definitely a message that, that echoes where your work is referenced as, as an artist, not necessarily as a photographer. And I think, I th yeah, I, th I, th I think it's, it's something that should be implored, it, like done more, I think. And I think it's a nice little, nice little point you, you pointed out. So um, does anyone else have any, any final questions? No. Oh yeah. Yep. How important is it that you really like the image? Uh, if if it's my work. Yeah. I mean, it's everything. I mean, it's everything. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um. If Thanks. if I don't like it, it's not getting. It's not going anywhere. No.
the I've got to like it. I mean, that's the reason I do this. Otherwise, I'd still be in the city earning a um, seven-figure salary as a lawyer. But no, I'm instead earning a much smaller figure as a photographer because I love it, and I'm only going to share pictures I like. So I do actually have the classic view of the waterfall upstaging the mountain, and I did it right, and it's sharp front to back, and the light was good, and I will never show that to anybody. <laughs> Thank you. Marvellous. Anybody else? No. Well, no. that was good timing for the mic to start messing about, wasn't it? It, it, is, it is indeed. Um, Rachel, once again, can you just um, say where people can catch up with you and all of, all of that stuff? Yeah, so um, my website is my name, so it's pretty easy. Apparently, there's no one else on the whole planet with that particular name spelled that way, so that's easy. Um, and it's my name on Instagram, which is my main social media. Twitter, although I might leave Twitter very soon, as my friend Lizzie Shepherd has just done, because it's become a very horrible place. And Facebook, I'm never there. But if you want to follow me there, fine. Um, and that's my workshops website. And I also do workshops in Iceland and workshops in Nazaré, Portugal, photographing the biggest waves in the world for ocean capture. Thank you. Oh, I just thought one more question. What's what's next? So, where did, where is your work gonna gonna go in the future? Are you ever gonna walk away from the waves, as it were? I have already. Yeah, um, I'm doing different work now. Um, the galleries still want to sell the waves, and they still do sell the waves, and there's still enough just to make me more money and make it all worthwhile. Um, but the work I'm doing now is very different, and I'm doing it for me. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.